Good afternoon. On behalf of the Cedars and the person of college, it is a joy to see each one of you. Bob and I were just talking, and we are just about to wrap up the second consecutive year of First Fridays. Colleen and I have been working, contacting individuals. We have persons now lined up through the month of June. Next month, uh, you should have a delightful presentation from Laura Ells. Laura is our teacher extraordinaire in the area of, of sociology. And uh, her program, I think, should be quite intriguing. It's one that she did in Wichita fairly recently, having to do with issues related to senior safety, internet scams, just some of the challenges that all of us face uh, living in a world filled with technology. It's certainly my privilege to welcome a long-term colleague, Dan Hoffman. Dan is professor of physical education at McPherson, was a long-term uh, volleyball coach, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what direction Dan is going to go today, but he's always uh, promoted a real strong interest between sport and religion, teaches ethics, very broadly trained, so I think most of you know Dan. Dan, welcome, we're glad to have you here. Can you, can you hear me? Well, thank you. I, I want to welcome everybody here. Uh, uh, I, I guess I've got some goals for today, and one of my goals is to, to maybe uh, uh, change your thinking pattern or stimulate your thinking pattern a little bit and uh, let you into a little bit of my life uh, to kind of see where I'm coming from. Uh, I hope that we can uh, do this session more as a, a, a conversation versus a lecture. And if you have questions, uh, either pipe up or just raise your hand, I don't, e either way. And I'll be happy to uh, address or explain more of, of what I'm saying. And uh, there's a good chance I'll be wrong at some point. And so uh, certainly, certainly, yeah, I know Doris is up front. I'm already in trouble. Uh, but I, want, I, I have a real interest. I've, I've been at McPherson College a little over 30 years now. And I uh, started with Doris. Uh, and I've, I've coached nearly uh, all of the sports, uh, both men and women. I, I've not coached uh, soccer and I've not coached any of the softball or baseball. Other than that, I've, I, I've coached at least for a little bit every other sport. And I've gotten a feel for our students and uh, we just really have some great students. And I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the intersection of sport, religion, and character. And uh, I'll start out my, uh, uh, my conversation by talking about Plato a little bit. Plato says you can m learn more about a man in an hour of play than you can in a lifetime of conversation. <laughs> now, wh why is that funny? I mean, what is, what is Plato saying? Anybody? <laughs> Wow. Your character comes out. Why? Well, I don't know why, but it does. <laughs> okay, okay. And it does. We get all emotional, all excited when we get into uh, uh, this thing called competition, which a lot of times play revolves, uh, evolves into some competition. We get all excited about that. All of a sudden, uh, we're not, not playing a game, we're playing for keeps. And uh, as I, I teach my classes, uh, I teach a, a team sports class at the college right now, and I opened up the, 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 uh, the class by saying, hey, look, in 15 minutes after class is over, nobody's gonna remember if you won or lost. And secondly, nobody cares. They just don't care. But they will remember how you performed and, and how you played. And, and that's true. And I can go back and I can ask you, I'll ask this group, who won the, uh, the KCAC uh, two years ago in volleyball? Nobody knows. Okay? That, those are good guesses. Uh, but nobody knows. Who won, who won uh, cross country last year? They did not. But that's a good guess. We won track. Yeah, we didn't win cross country. And so, so even when you reach the top of your, in our case, little pond, you don't know unless you are a part of that, right? If we were a part of that, then we remember. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, character. 
And I did quite a bit of research on character, and I think we ought to probably define that. Now, you said that uh, uh, your character comes out. Can you, can you expand on that at all? Well, I think your competition and how you accept when you're thinking, baby, being defeated and just your body, your body language. Your, okay. It, it's, character is a really squishy thing to define, and I don't think you can possibly define it without including morals. I mean, it seems to me like you've got to include some kind of a foundation of morals when you start uh, uh, defining character. And so, if we start thinking about that, and my research uh, included the, the ability of sport to build character. Everybody says, if you're involved in sport, it builds character. Okay? And so I researched it. You know what happened? We're wrong. Not only does sport not build character, it retards character. That's pretty sad, particularly when you go into an area that I'm going into, right? Can you explain that? I can. Uh, when, when we talk about competition, uh, what are you willing to do to win? And when we test that, and I had two, two uh, actually I have an instrument with me, uh, uh, I, uh, two researchers uh, developed an instrument and they compared at the college level non-athletes versus athletes. And in every single instance, try it across every single program, the non-athletes scored higher on the character scale based on moral values than the athletes did in every single one. And the higher the level of athlete, you know, if, if you're junior high, it was different than if you went to high school, if you went to college, if you went to the pros. The higher the level, the lower it became. And you wonder, why is that? Why is that? And it's based around this, competition, this concept of competition. What are you willing to do to win? And you think about what we do in, in, in life, in total life. What are we willing to do to win? You know, how many people in here, if they got caught speeding, are going to own up to how fast they were going? Oh, I'm sorry, officer, I was doing 82 in a school zone. <laughs> okay? How no. does that speak to what happened in North Carolina? <clears throat> are you talking about the, uh, the paper classes, the paper courses? Yeah, that's, that's actually, I was going to talk about North Carolina. That's, that's a huge issue. Uh, if you don't know what she's talking about, North Carolina had... Uh, uh, actually, for the, uh, as, as coming out, the last 15 years, they had, uh, and they, th they threw their professor of American, uh, uh, African American studies under the bus on this one to start with. Said, this guy's the only one that knows what he's doing. He's, he's offering courses that they don't show up for, they don't take, and he gives them grades. And they call them paper courses. And so they never did it. One kid took 19 courses. 19 courses. That's, that's half your, your college degree where he didn't do anything. And, and actually, the issue right now is, do we retro that kid and make him come back and take courses? Do, we've already granted him a degree. Does he get to keep it? And what's going to end up happening is that they're all going to get to keep their degrees. You know? But I was talking with somebody, uh, a Tim Swarson group the other day. I will absolutely guarantee you there's not a coach that's coaching that doesn't know uh, what the, I'm going to say fluff courses are on campus. What course can I put my kid into that he's going to get a good grade in? Every coach knows that, except for evidently Roy Williams, who had no idea what was going on. Right? Gosh, I didn't know anything about that. But the, the interesting thing about that whole thing is, is uh, the links we're willing to do to cover up. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, don't find out I did something wrong. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover up and cover up. And what does that say to students about your character? And it doesn't, doesn't bode well. So, so yeah. Uh, we also did research based on whether you're playing a team sport or an individual sport. If you're in an individual sport, you did a little better in terms of character because now you're only responsible for your own, own direction. If you're in a team sport, you're responsible for your teammates too. And so if I've got responsibilities for these other people and I can cheat to help them out, I'm more than willing to do that. Okay? And so, so they did this study, uh, and it was a really interesting study. 
But I thought, well, geez, I'm, I'm here at McPherson College and we've got a, a college Christian atmosphere. Surely our athletes are different than everybody else's athletes in the public schools because most of the research was done at, at universities, at the public, public uh, universities and colleges. And uh, so I did a little more research and uh, <laughs> the rest of the research said it makes no difference. And even outside of the athletic realm, I saw a study that said, if you are a member of a church or deeply religious, uh, your moral values or character is zero different than somebody that does not attend. In fact, if you're a member of a more fundamentalist type church, uh, where you're not as, as lenient or uh, willing to be more flexible, it's even lower. And I'm not sure what scale they were using to determine their, their morality scale, but it, it, was, an, it was an interesting uh, st study that I, I thought. Anyhow, I want to uh, keep moving forward. Um, so, so what I'm saying is religious people don't necessarily, are not necessarily more moral than non-religious people. Now, I think it's impossible to look at morals, values, character without looking at your own background. And you've got to have that, that background, that experience. So the, the foundation always are the experiences that you've had. And everybody's background uh, uh, is going to be different. Okay? Uh, I, I guess I won't get in trouble. I'm going to talk fairly openly here. Uh, <laughs> if, if we look at something our culture does versus something another culture does, okay? Our culture, as soon as a, a male baby is born in our culture, Almost every one of them gets circumcised. Not a problem. Our culture accepts that. Okay? There was another culture that said, as soon as every female is, is born, we're going to circumcise her, which is totally different. We call that genital mutilation. So if it's done on a female, it's genital mutilation. If it's done on a male, it's the norm. Okay? And so we have different values based on different cultures. And I am going to uh, uh, speak out in opposition of that. Because if I, if I bought that relativism, which, which most Americans believe that's, that's true, whatever culture you're in is, is the guidelines you have to abide by. And I say there are universal moral values that we all have to abide by in spite of what our laws say. So if we, if we buy into that relative, then I can tell you that the sports thing makes no difference because the playing field is a different field than the public field. And I can't make that case. If I'm a universalist, I can't make that case. And so I say that what you do in public, the way you act in public is the way you ought to act on the playing field. Would you, you know, would you cut in line in public in order to get a better spot? Well, only if you're in a car. Everybody, everybody's been in a traffic jam. You guys go zipping by, then they, then they break and they wedge away. But you wouldn't do that in the line cafeteria when you're face to face. Well, probably, maybe some would. Okay, so it's it's different. Uh, 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 it, it, in my mind, what the way you perform on the field has got to be exactly the same way you would perform in life. We are the same. We are one person. We are the same. And when we look at it from a Christian perspective. Um, we think about, from, from a Christian perspective, we look at the New Testament. And the New Testament is all about uh, uh, service, uh, modeling what you're doing, helping others. When, when somebody strikes you, you allow them to strike you on the other side. You know, and you think about all those Christian values, and how do you make that mesh into an athletic competition? And that's where it gets really hard. In fact, some of the studies that I've done said once a athlete, professional athlete, has truly found Christ, they're not good athletes anymore. Now, I was at the, uh, several years ago, I was at the sports center, and uh, one of our area coaches came in, and I'm going to paraphrase here a little bit, but he was talking about an athlete that, that he had that was uh, exceptional, a, a notch above. And he said, you know, it seems like to be a really good athlete, you've got to be a little bit of a jerk. What an incredibly poor commentary on what we are doing in athletics these days. Why do you have to be a jerk to be a good athlete? I mean, to me, that, that totally negates everything that, that I want to spend my time coaching. 
You know, I don't think you have to be a jerk to be a good athlete. I think some of the greatest athletes, and, and, and the jerks are all in the news these days. I mean, let's look at it. We've got, we've got uh, uh, wife beaters, uh, uh, domestic, domestic, violence, not wife, domestic violence. We've got uh, uh, child abuse cases going on right now, and, and they're out front. By the way, I've always been curious about this, uh, and maybe you can enlighten me a little bit. If you've got somebody that's in civil court for something they're doing, should your employer also punish you? Is the civil court enough of a punishment, or should your employer also have a, a, a say on, on your, uh, your employment? Do you get judged twice? Seems like that's what we want to do. Can the civil courts go ahead and handle it and then let the employer uh, go ahead? And I'm not sure where I stand all of, on all of that, but I'm just, it's, it seems like if you're getting judged by the civil court and you've paid your price to society, that ought to be good enough for your employer. But maybe not. I, you know, and, and there are lots of certain, certain instances where you think, oh my gosh, well, you're going to put this, uh, this, this child abuser, you know, uh, as your preschool teacher? Or do you need to know that before they come in? In spite of the fact that they've done rehab and everything else and paid the price to society. So uh, we have this. And so I, I will come from a universal versus a relative. I will come from a universal perspective uh, as I'm talking. And, uh, and I am telling you that uh, no matter what level you're at, we still have uh, uh, ethical and moral issues. We have on campus right now uh, a basketball athlete that is a notch above. This, this kid is the real deal. He is very, very good. Okay? He chose to come to McPherson College for whatever reason. While he was at McPherson College, uh, other coaches that were recruiting him have continued to call while he's a student on our campus. And they have promised him that if, they, if he doesn't play for us and he goes elsewhere in place, he will get some, some playing time, at least at minimum, overseas playing time. That's, you know, that's, for, a, for a kid, that sounds pretty doggone good. I, that, that's the first step in going to the big leagues. Now, is he big league material? In my mind, no. Is he all KCAC, maybe all American material at, at NAI? Yeah. I mean, the kid's good. And so what did he do? He quit the day before first game. I'm not going to waste a season at McPherson College when I've got all this other stuff going. So, what the, but the irritating part about the, all that is the ethics of the other coaches that continued to contact this kid while he'd already made his decision to, to uh, be at McPherson College. So we, we see it uh, in, in lots of different ways all of the time. Isn't that against the rules? Well, it depends on uh, uh, whose rules. It, if, if it's KCAC, absolutely. But when we're talking other, other rules, it, it depends on the value systems. These are other coaches, not KCAC? Not, not, no, no, these are Division II, Division I coaches. These are, these are, uh, they, they are uh, coaches that are not NAI. They're NCAA coaches that have continued to call him. And they but, ban them? They're not supposed to. We had a... Uh, well, maybe some of you remember, we had a pretty, pretty powerful uh, football coach on campus by the name of Steve Kazar uh, years ago. And he recruited a, a defensive coordinator from California. And I was AD at the time. And I got a letter immediately from our alums and said, I can't believe you're hiring this guy as your defensive coordinator. He's just been ousted by uh, a school out in California for uh, inappropriate recruiting and, and violations. And, and the NCAA had actually sanctioned him. He wasn't going get to get the uh, coach at all. And so I called him in my office and I said, uh, uh, what's up with all this stuff going on? And he says, well, you know, the rules that I broke really weren't that important. That's the first thing he said out of his mouth. And, I, <laughs> and I, you know, we ended up working it out. The coach, we had started the season and things were gone. And it ended up that we allowed him to go ahead and coach while, and do no recruiting. While he was on campus, he could be the defensive coordinator. As soon as the last game was over, he was gone. And that's, that's the way we ended up working it out. But, uh, 
you wonder about that attitude of, okay, here are the rules, but I'm really the judge of the rules, and I'll tell you what's an important rule and what's not an important rule. And that's, that's essentially what he was saying to us. So uh, I want to I, I get into, is this on? Yes. I want to get into uh, sport and religion and, and how they're, they're uh, very similar because we've had this, this massive shift now uh, uh, from what takes place on the Sabbath. I, I will tell you that when, when my son David uh, was growing up and was playing soccer, we said, we'll let you play soccer on Sunday after church. So we're going to church, you can play afterwards. By the time Matt came through, we were uh, skipping church to go to Topeka for the early morning soccer stuff. And we've drifted. And uh, I don't know whether it was just my family or, or uh, uh, society in general, but uh, Sunday seems to be a day for sports. And it's taken priority uh, uh, a lot of times over, over church. And I'm not saying church is the ultimate in terms of religion. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying it is, it is an organization and it does certainly have some, some, uh, some benefits of being a, a member of. So let's look at sports and religion and see how they're similar. Sports and religion both have, both have uh, buildings for communal gatherings and special events. Church has that. Stadiums have that. So it's a, it's a place for special events. Both have, have procedures and dramas linked to personal betterment. Both emerge out of the same quest for, for perfection in body, mind, and spirit. Both events scheduled to celebrate values of festive occasions. Both have rituals before, during, and after major events. I mean, think about it, they're exactly the same. Both have heroes and legends about their accomplishments. Both are used to celebrate and reproduce the values of society. I'll try to slide that up here a little bit. Both can evoke intense excitement and emotional commitment. Both can give deep personal meaning to life. Both can distract attention from important social, political, and economic issues, becoming an opiate of the masses. So we know that, that we have this. The, the difference, in, at least in my mind, uh, between this is we don't have this uh, transcendental God that actually is out there in the sports, unless we're using heroes as our transcendental God, maybe those that have gone before. I mean, I, I still don't understand the retiring of uniforms. I don't get it. And I know people have, have been very, really good athletes, but somebody is going to come along and they're going to be better. So let's, let's, you know, let's just leave the numbers out there and let everybody have a chance to play that. Now, how do coaches use, use uh, religion? They use it to cope with uncertainty. They use it to keep their athletes out of trouble. They use it to give meaning to sports participation. Now, I'm not real sure about this, but they use it to put sport participation in a balanced perspective. And I, I am not real sure how, how good of a job as coaches we're doing uh, with that. They use it to, to unify the team. They maintain social control on the teams using uh, religion. And they use it for success. Now, I want to show you some quotes that uh, in my mind are just, just loads of fun. And if you can theologically explain to me how this, this works out, uh, I would appreciate that. But look at, look at some of these quotes. I'm not playing for the fans or the money, but I'm playing to honor God. I know my motivation. I know where I'm headed. Every night, I try to go out there and honor him and play great. David Roberts, Robertson. And by the way, I looked up David Robinson. He's, he really is one of the very few athletes that's gone out and he's practiced what he preached. 
he went out and he established schools for the disadvantaged, established programs for the he, he gave a lot of his money away. So he's gone out and, and done that. But, but listen to this. David Robinson believes God wants him to be the best basketball player he can be. Nonsense. He uses Jesus and God to rubber stamp ideas contrary to Christianity. Jesus would be aghast at how we use his name to bless our sports contests. This is a retired colonel, a, a chaplain from a, an army. Would Jesus be aghast at the way we use him in our sports competition? Students asked me to, when I was coaching, students would ask me to uh, pray before event. If they asked me to pray, I would pray for, with them. If they did not ask me, I did not pray before an event. And I, and I, and I will tell you why. In my mind, prayer is special. An athletic event is not special. If I'm going to pray before all of my events, I've got to pray before every single class, before every single test, you know, before every meal, which we do. Why would I make sport even more special by saying, this is where I'm going to choose to pray? And that's the logic that I used. Okay? Could be totally wrong. I, maybe we ought to be praying every opportunity we get, no matter. Any excuse we have ought to be for, for prayer. Maybe that's what we ought to be doing. But in my mind, I didn't want students to perceive that I thought what they were doing on the playing field was more valuable than what they were doing uh, otherwise. I mean, what are the chances of we'll have any kid make a living playing a sport at McPherson College? You were there for 40 years. So how, many, how many professionals did you have? Well, to answer that question, what was, oh, No opportunities. It was available to women when I had the sports, the, the players that would have qualified. At that point, the women would have the professional level. Now they do, and so it's interesting. And true or not, I wonder if those students would have been at McPherson College had the emphasis been there. Well, one of them was definitely church related, had to be married. Yeah. Uh, the other one was a McPherson girl. And she would have had a lot of people after her. I'm talking about Laura Sumbo. Um, but we, we played more basketball than anybody else, so she, so she chose to come to McPherson College. So yeah. uh, that, that, that's really going to be the factor. But, but the answer is zero, right? We've had nobody no. that made a living in sport. We've got. We've, May have, may have had the ability to do that. Had there been women's professional at that point, I think they would have been capable of that. Okay, and, and that's a possibility. They were, they were dang good athletes. I mean, there's no question about that. We have uh, uh, students right now. Uh, I've got two football players. We've got two football players that are playing overseas, mostly for beer and pizza and housing. Uh, if they've got cars, I don't think they make enough to make their car payments. Uh, we've, we've got one that did some uh, international basketball, but uh, there was zippity doo dah money in that. Um, and we've got one that's still trying. Uh, so so you, you wonder where you ought to be putting your emphasis. I mean, even if they do get a chance to play professional uh, uh, sports and, and, and make a little bit of money, what bearing will that have on their, their total life? I think about, I, have, I, have, I had two heroes, two sports heroes growing up. Uh, my first sport hero was a guy by the name of Gale Sayers. Uh, if you remember Gale Sayers, he was a running back for Chicago. Uh, I think he was a Kansas guy. Yeah, and uh, I can remember uh, dad, but a little kid said, Dan, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, professional football player. He thought that was the funniest thing ever. You know, guy wants to be a professional football player. I listened to Gail Sayers speak. Uh, the, the, we brought him here to McPherson. Uh, Chamber brought him here as, as an exceptional athlete. And uh, he was horrible. All he did is moan and groan and complain about uh, the salary that he got when he played versus what they're getting now and the lack of support. 
And he, I'm thinking, you have this platform to, to, to talk to people about something significant, and you want to stand up here and moan and groan about what you're, you're making. So uh, I, I knocked him off my hero list. And then I had another guy, I, I was a decathlete in college, and my hero was a guy by the name of Bruce Jenner. Maybe some of you heard of Bruce Jenner. And uh, uh, so we're at a, a national track meet when I was coaching, and Bruce came in and, and, and he talked. And it may have been the worst speech I've ever heard in my life. That guy had no depth whatsoever, zero. An interesting thing about Bruce Jenner is, is his wife, Christy, uh, supported him all the years that he was an athlete. And as soon as he uh, won and got money, he divorced her. And amazingly, he was the father of the year that year. Now, I, I guess you can still be the father of the year if you, if you split your family. But in my mind, that, that, that just doesn't mesh very well. So, so my, my sports heroes have kind of been uh, uh, knocked out from under me a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Randall Cunningham, maybe some of you know Randall Cunningham. Lord, I know it's you at work, you've done it again. Randall Cunningham, right after he threw a touchdown pass. And my question, do you, do you think... God had anything at all to do with whether that guy caught the ball or ran or threw it? I mean, is that, uh, when, when people say, you know, God knows every hair you have on your head and everything you're doing, uh, th does he really care about whether you threw a touchdown pass or not at any level? Maybe he does. I don't know, but... but uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that, that uh, we only do this during success. I, would, I, I one time want to see a D-back, after they get burnt for a touchdown, say, thank you, Jesus. You know, I get a chance to be on this field and play. Thank you. But we never hear it that way. NAI started this thing called Champions of Character. And when they did this, uh, I had had about the... Uh, three pretty solid years of research on character. And the NAI uh, concept of character was a feel-good concept. It had really no basis. So they brought this guy in, he spoke to us, and they asked for some critiques. So I, I literally wrote about three pages of critique and turned it into the guy. Nobody read it, except for the guy who got a hold of me and I sent him some material on, on, uh, on character. So the first convention that we go to, I'm sitting there uh, at the convention. They're going to do a champion of character for a coach. And I'm sitting there with the KCAC coaches. And uh, some of the KCAC coaches there had been, been doing some playoffs, and they were very familiar with some of these other coaches. The first guy that got the Champions of Character Award, the guy at the table said, I've never seen a bigger cheat in all of my life. That guy breaks every single rule. The Champions of Character were based upon your win-loss record. Isn't that amazing? Give the champions the characters as somebody that, that actually shows character. You know, that you don't have to be first to have good character. Okay, so now they've switched it up a little bit. They've got uh, programs or teams and, and they're doing a little better job at this point. But, but it's, amazingly, everybody for the first several years, everybody that got the champions of character award had success in the win-loss column. And I just, I just thought that was a really interesting concept. That you can't have character and get beat. Uh, I don't want to read that one. Here, this is Bill Bright. He's, uh, he was the president and founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. Does the Bible then teach that competition is wrong? Is it unspiritual to want to raise to the top, to excel? Far from being harmful, competition is a gift of God. Therefore, I do not disagree, as some do, with people who pray to win or succeed. Obviously, while Christian players on opposing teams may pray for a victory, only one team can win. But does that mean, but that, but does not, but that does not mean God is put on the spot. Christians should pray to be the best they can for the glory of God. Hmm. Why don't, why don't we, we had a, 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 a guy, Dale Goldsmith, most of you know Dale Goldsmith, and he was, uh, sometimes, he, he was, when I was the uh, athletic director, he was the one I reported, and sometimes his concepts are just out there, you know, and if you know Dale, you know he's, he's kind of out there, so, so why, why do we always have to have a winner and a loser? Why can't we set it up where everybody uh, has, has an opportunity to succeed? 
Okay, how would you do that, Dale? You know, in sports, it is possible, in my mind, to play the very best game that you have played all season long and to do very well and still lose, in my mind. Not in our students' minds. They've been so ingrained, and I'm teaching a class right now, history, philosophy, and sport, and I'm telling you, they are so ingrained that success only means you've won. If you've improved, if you've improved vastly, it doesn't make any difference. What did the scoreboard say? And to me, that's fairly sad, Amy. Say, so what about those personal bests in track? Those PRs, yeah, absolutely. And I can, you know, track is, is that, that was my favorite sport to coach, and it may be the greatest sport ever. And I'm, I'm biased, I know that. And some of you probably like other sports better. But, but think about track. I mean, you can have somebody that is not going to score all season long, and you can get all excited about a PR. Oh, my gosh. You just jumped six inches farther than you've ever jumped in your whole life. That's pretty cool, right? Now, in other events, they, they'd never get on the playing field or the court if they're just, just modest. And so track is really, I just thoroughly enjoyed coach track. By the way, Amy's a, a, a record holder at, at McPherson in the high jump outdoor. Actually, you tied with Denise, right? Yeah. So uh, any, anyhow, let's move on to something else. Oh, Newt Rocky. I, I tell you what, I, this is one of my test questions. So when I'm talking to the kids, I ask this testers. I love Newt Rockney. Prayers work best when the players are big. <laughs> Kids don't get it. The students don't get it. <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah, play, prayer works best when the players are big. Newt Rockney. He also said, uh, one man practicing sportsmanship is far better than 50 preaching it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got, I mean, I think the guy had a grasp on what was going on. I just really like that. At worst, religion is just one more means by which coaches can keep players busy and in line. If there were no God, head coaches would have to invent one. Uh, well, here's something I find interesting. This is Tom Landry. Uh, uh, he coached for uh, Dallas for a long time. I think this is where football and Christianity have a very close relationship because to live a Christian life, a person has to be just as disciplined in the things he does as a player does to be successful in football. We feel we can build character and develop good traits in athletes as this is why I think an athlete is such a great candidate for Jesus Christ. I have a terrible time with discipline. I mean, I always have. Ask my parents. Okay, I, I don't get discipline. Why do you want me to march rank and file based upon your standards? I'm a big boy, I can think. Football is an amazing sport because it's discipline, discipline, discipline. I don't understand, lateral's a, a, a good play, right? Why don't you lateral seven or eight times? Just get a bunch of guys with great hands and lateral all the way down the field. Most of you say, ah, that'd never work. That'd never work. I was talking with some football players the other day. We had a guy by the name of uh, Turtle James. You remember Turtle James? Maybe you don't remember him. He was, he was the fastest kid we had on campus, and he was a, a split end for us. The guy could run. But we stuck him. We were playing a 5-3. Put him right dead center on defense sometimes. And they're not a big guy that could block him. The guy weighed probably a buck 60. I mean, he wasn't very big, maybe 70. And he'd get by them every single time. And I say, why, why don't you just fill the whole defensive line with skinny guys that are faster than everybody else. You know, now, when you get to the goal line, you've got to have some beef. I mean, it's, it's just a big scrum at the goal line, right? So you've got to be able to push. You can't use leverage to sneak around. But we've got this discipline, discipline, discipline. When I was playing football, uh, my coach said, don't you ever turn your back on the ball as a defensive back. So if you're coming out for a pass, you know, the quarterback's over here, and you cut this way, I'd come up and I'd turn this way and try to go with you, right? That's the dumbest thing in the world. But if you didn't do it right, then they made you run. 
But you lost the pros if you're coming out and you go this way. A pro will look, look, and turn and go with you, which is way more efficient. Turn your back on the ball and get there in a hurry. But we have all this discipline, discipline, discipline. And I'm thinking, hey, you've got 70 kids out there. Let them think for themselves. Yeah, I do believe there are some concepts that you want to get across, right? If you're going to blitz, you better get the quarterback pretty quick or your D-backs are in trouble. I mean, everybody needs to know that. I don't care how you blitz. Just, just go get the quarterback and make him throw it in a hurry. Then the D-backs won't get stuck back out there with a scrambling quarterback because that's, that's deadly. So I'm not, I'm not real big on this discipline, discipline, discipline. I, uh, in my own personal theology, I just I don't understand how discipline fits in. You know, I don't understand. It is not discipline for uh, uh, me to remain true to my wife. That is not discipline. That's something I want to do. Right? So th that's not discipline. It's, it's not discipline uh, to do something that you want to do uh, or be creative about it. So, so why do we need to be disciplined in Christ, as Tom, Tom Landry is saying? Just food for thought. Here's, here's one that I really like. Football coaches, even those whose personal approach to life and sports runs hard against the grain of the golden rule, must have known that to require their players to pray before games, a bit of hypocrisy not lost on former Michigan State coach uh, Duff Doherty, who reportedly once quipped, all those coaches who require pre-game prayer for their players ought to be made to attend church at least once a week. I am uh, one of the, in my mind, one of the major uh, uh, tenets of the Church of the Brethren is, is modeling. If you want your athletes to do something, you model that. Okay? If you want your kids to do something, you model that. Okay, then they can choose whether they want to be part of that model or not. So if you want your kids to go to church, you better model going to church. Right? If you want your kids to make good decisions, you better model making good decisions. And it's really, it's, it's not like you're going out on a limb and, and stretching yourself. It's, it's just something that just is very easily, it comes to you. You know, it's, it's really pretty simple. So, uh, and we don't do much of that. I had a kid uh, one time that uh, uh, turned in a paper, a philosophy paper, and he said, uh, my goal is to make every kid throw up the first day of practice. Your goal is to make every kid throw up the first day of practice. You're going to run them hard enough, they're going to throw up first day of practice. I said, I got a better idea. Why don't you go out and run with them? If you want to make an impression on those kids, anybody can blow a whistle. That doesn't take any special talent. Get out there and run with them. That will make an impression. I guarantee you. You get out and run with those kids, it will make an impression. Even if it's not every single one. And as I got older, I ran with the women cross country rather than the men when I was coaching cross country. And, and not on sprint days either, just the, the, the long, slow distance days. You know? But still, model what you want to have happen. It just, it just, just, just makes sense to me. Why can't you model prayer there? You don't have to you can. ask for victory, but for everyone to play safely. Oh yeah, that's what I pray for when I pray. And everyone have a safe trip home. You don't need to pray for victory or have the best athlete out there or whatever. I agree. I think we're on the same page. I'm, I'm, I'm very much into that. So, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm a, little, a little odd probably in that regard because uh, in Matthew, as I read Matthew, it, it uh, uh, tells you not to uh, go out and, and pray in public like the hypocrites, but rather go into the room behind closed doors and do it in a personal way. And so when we were uh, uh, doing the prayer with the, the women's basketball team for a while, they'd do the cross arms in both teams. And I, I was okay with that. It would not have been something that I would have initiated. I'm more of a behind the scenes kind of a, a person with that. I, I pray with kids all the time. 
you know, we've got crises, crises going on, and I say, can I, can, I, can I say a prayer with you? And it, almost always they just love it, you know. But, but I, I'm okay with that, too. I think if you're going to pray, there's no, no reason you can't pray for the safety of everybody. Every single athlete on that field is probably trained exactly the same as every other athlete. They deserve to be treated like they've trained hard, just like your own people have. So I, I, I agree with you, I think. Yes. I'm trying to understand this discipline thing. You, okay. You call a play for the football team. Uh huh. And you go on what number you want to go on. Okay. Not the same number. You switch the numbers every time? Well, no. Just say you go, uh, we have this play, and whenever you're ready, we'll run it. <laughs> well, that, how does discipline fit into that? Well, I think you've got to have some standards. You've got to have some guidelines. But I don't think, I don't think you've got to have rules. Uh, um, let me give you an example from this year. We have uh, uh, a team that uh, had some, some uh, major rules in terms of, of drinking. And the kids got caught drinking. So early in the season, it was... Boom, you're out. Later in the season, it was, well, maybe we could just do a couple of wind sprints and, and, and call it good and kind of forgive. And a lot of times it depended on the caliber of the athlete that got caught. I know, you would think that wouldn't happen, right? Huh. So uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in the same treatment for everybody in terms of discipline, that, that kind of treatment. And I'm interested in, in discipline in terms of, of, of being unified as a team, but I'm also interested in, in thought process and allowing students to have input into to how things work. Do you know when I first got here on campus, our football was, was not good. And I went out there one day and, you know, I'd played football all my life. I went out there one day and said, okay, uh, draw a play in the dirt, let's go. Literally, they could not draw a play in the dirt. I'd never seen any, who, who can't draw a football play in the dirt? I was shocked. They'd been disciplined. Somebody had been doing it all the time. And so they say, well, gosh, if somebody's not telling me, how can I be creative to do it myself? B basically what I'm saying, sports can build character. I'm telling you, it can. Has it? No. We're doing something wrong. But sports can build character if led correctly. I think uh, 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 Roland Ortmeier, Got any Ortmeyer people in here? Anybody in here know who Roland Ortmeyer is? Just dead? You know Roland from California, Laverne. Uh, had, a, had a start on that. Do you know Roland? You know Roland? Okay. Okay. Had a start on that. And uh, uh, he, he literally told me when I got out there, I was out at Laverne for a month. He said, hey, those guys don't come to practice. I don't care. If they come to practice, that's even better. But if they don't, that's up to that. You won't get any better, you know. And he may not start them, but he still played them. But it seems to me like in the growth process, we've got to give our students, our athletes, uh, uh, some independence. You start making decisions that make sense. You know? You don't and, think it makes sense to want everyone there to practice together every day? Um, if you how good do you want your team? How good does the team want to be? Well, are they being fair to the team by not being there to practice? Are they being fair to the team to not practice hard? Even if they're there? No. Okay. But they sure can't do that if they're not there. They can't do that well, unless they're practicing on their own which is what I really liked about track. <laughs> so, that's, that's part, have you, have you ever worked in a group where everybody did the same amount of work? No, somebody always does more. Somebody's always carrying somebody else. And every single group I've ever been involved with. And the person that wants the A, you know, if, if, if you're a C guy, and you, and you still, then the person who wants to say is going to cover for you, right? So, but that's, that's part, of, part of learning uh, what's life about. 
Do you, do you feel bad that uh, only a third of the people voted the last election? Two-thirds opted not to vote? How do we know if we got the right candidates in? <laughs> oh, you, you know? <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Okay, I brought it near the end. I, I want to I kind of wrap some stuff up here, and I don't think there's any... any so so what, what, is, what is the whole thing about? Here, here's what I, what I think. I think the whole reason that we're around and we're, we're here and we're doing stuff is, is simply relationships. Okay? What I did as an athlete, I will know about, probably nobody else knows, probably nobody else besides my parents know in this room what I accomplished as an athlete. And, and it's not, a, maybe doors, I don't know. Yeah, and, and, and it's, not, it's not a big deal. But what, what, what it's about is relationships and how we establish like, what I have done with my students, what I've done with my athletes. Um, who comes to see me? Our new football coach, uh, uh, our, our, our last football coach, uh, things didn't go well for him. And there wasn't a single football game, and I went to every game la uh, last year, it was a single football game that a faculty member or a, a parent walked up to me and said, Coach, that was a good game. You did a nice job. Not once, except for me. I was the only one that would visit with him after a game. Our new coach comes in. I said, your goal is to have faculty and parents come up and visit with you after the game. You establish those relationships. Okay? I was at the uh, uh, Kayford Convention uh, last Thursday. Uh, it's the state PE convention, and there's a gal there that was adamant that I say, see Doris, uh, uh, Diane from, she was a tennis player from the Lions. Diane starts with a W. What, she knows you, she was from uh, Abilene Middle School. Diane Wyatt. Diane Wyatt. All right, and she was adamant that I tell Doris that she was the National Middle School PE Teacher of the Year. She wanted Doris to be proud of her, even, she's probably 50, isn't she, or 55? Even at that age, she wanted to make sure that Doris knew that. I'm telling you, that's a relationship. That's a relationship. That's, that's why we're here. Yeah, try to remember them next time, won't you? <laughs> Well, it's Abilene, Dave, I, and I asked her if she knew, she said, oh, yeah, I know Dave. So, okay, I'm, uh, I, I'm pretty done. Anybody have any questions? They want to, yeah. Uh, well, I would like to hear you comment on the, uh, the arrest of the, of the football players from a few years ago as they got in a fight uh, with someone uh -oh. on the table. Yeah, we had... Uh, uh, we had uh, a, an unfortunate incident where uh, some of our kids had a party off campus and uh, some of the Tabor players uh, came and were a part of that. Now, the interesting thing is that the two kids that we had that were arrested were called football players. Neither one of them were on the team. In fact, the coaches didn't even know them. But they were both PE majors. They should have said PE program at McPherson College is developing this kind of young man. I mean, they should, should have blamed PE. They were my people, right? They were not, uh, they were ex-football players. Uh, the Tabor kids were, were uh, uh, football, the football players. Football players got a bad, uh, bad black eye, and they weren't even on the team. Is that right? The, the two kids who were arrested weren't on the team. There were football players at the party that were not part of the incident. And uh, it just is it's one of those things that, that went bad and got worse. And I don't know what all came out, because I didn't read the transcript from the lawyers. I know what our students say, and uh, uh, it's just it was a really unfortunate time. I know I read some tweets uh, where uh, some gal from McPherson, sounded like a youngster that just hadn't been around the block too many times, just, just accused every single McPherson football player as being like rapists and just incredibly bad things about our football. And I'm telling you, we got some, <laughs> we got some of the, the, the best guys you've ever seen playing for football f with it for us. Now we got some marginal kids too. I'm not telling you, everybody's great. But, but so did Tabor. You know, so does every other school around. So well, what? It wasn't, uh, it wasn't just the team got a black eye. 
The campus got a black eye. Everybody felt bad about it, and uh, it was just a, a terrible thing. It was, it was an incredibly terrible thing, and it got worse because it got publicized poorly. Uh, my brother uh, teaches at uh, uh, Newton, and he came in. He said he's walking through the hall, and uh, one of the teachers said, don't ever go to McPherson College. That's where they teach you to kill people. Okay, and, and uh, fortunately he has enough cojones, he jumped right in the middle of that, so that is absolutely not true, you know. And uh, in my mind, uh, I still believe, as unfortunate as everything was, there was uh, certainly some uh, self-defense, and uh, I am uh, pretty certain we did not instigate the issue. I can say that with almost 100% certainty. Did we over, overreact? Absolutely. Was justice done? Probably not, in, in my mind. The yes. thing that I, I wondered about was I felt like we threw him under the bus. Aren't we supposed to be innocent until proven guilty? Mm -hmm. And right away, they're out of here. They're not our students anymore. You mean the college did that? I didn't, I didn't perceive the college as doing that. As a matter of fact, I know Shea Macklin did an incredible job uh, visiting them while they were in jail and uh, st standing by their side, talking with their parents and their family. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that the, the college, uh, I mean, I didn't feel like the college threw them under the bus. I thought they got a lot of support, actually. Well, that's what it said in the paper, though. And what, because we weren't privy to anything, yeah. That's what we heard. Yeah. Were they, were they great fits for McPherson College? I don't know. It didn't work out well. I, I know yeah, what the history was. Yeah. If if you've never, it, recruiting is so so hard. I mean, e even if you're an employer and, and, and getting employed, you never know for sure based on an interview what you're getting. I mean, you just don't know. So I will tell you, I was incredibly disappointed on Wednesday. I was uh, playing pickleball. I had my keys over in the corner. And uh, uh, when I got them back, they were minus my master key. So somebody had taken my keys and pulled the master. They knew what it was. And so, I mean, I'm not very happy. And I'm, actually, I'm pretty angry. And I'm thinking through this, how I'm going to handle this. And I'm teaching this history and philosophy class. And this morning, I said, okay, since I'm teaching the class, I'm going to handle this uh, I'm, I'm an idealist, and I'm pretty, pretty posy, pretty upbeat. So uh, I'm going to handle this the way I think it ought to be handled. I tell you what, kids, I can't get that key back. That's what happened. They, they knew what happened. But you can get it back. Anybody in here, I mean, the best gift that I can give anybody in here is, is me. There's, there's nothing I can give you better than me. That's, that's the best I can give. And so anybody that gets me that key back, uh, you and a, you and a uh, uh, friend don't want to take out the Applebee's. So we'll see if it works out. I don't know. Oh no, they've got to earn that, don't they? They've got to earn that. You'll be calling me North Carolina. Okay, we we would we would have to differ on that. I I'm a, I'm I'm one of those guys that, that that thinks they ought to anyhow. I I don't believe in giving credit for attendance. That's what they ought to be doing. So, I just I just I just think that's it, is it the right thing to do to get it back? How long are you gonna let it go? Well, I, I assume they'll start changing locks here by the weekend. I don't know. I mean, everybody knows about it. But it was gone on uh, Wednesday afternoon. So, it will be expensive for the college, in ter and I told the kids, in terms of man hours, it's expensive. In terms of a new lock system, it's expensive. You know, it's just a, a ridiculous thing, but, but keep in mind that, that sometimes kids make decisions on the spur of the moment where they haven't thought it through. And how many other master keys have they been making and selling? Well, uh, they, they, yeah, they, I don't, I don't. These these are do not duplicate. I don't think they can make them. But but still, I just I just I just say that because I, I I think it ought to come back. I, I'm disappointed that we had a student on campus that felt the need to take, or or a staff or faculty. I don't know. I don't know who got it. I'm assuming a student, but that's that may be a bias on my part. So. 
Yeah. Well, going back to the, the football problem, that same time when when Paul Ziegler was killed, we we focused on that also, and that was that was good. That was good. Yeah, that was good. That was that was a really sad day too. So. Hmm. Yeah, it was it was a tough year. We we wrote lots of uh, lots of apolo I know for sure we wrote lots of apology letters. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm glad that's behind us. I'm glad to see it's still going on. Paul's pedal for balls. Pedal for balls, yeah, with the tennis program. Sure, yeah, that's pretty cool. And it probably will for a while. I don't know if everybody got a chance to attend the funeral, but that was one of the. If you can have a really good funeral, that 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 was one that was very meaningful for me. Just something that's happening right now in the news that I keep thinking relates to so much of what you talk about. It just came out in the news about this guy that wrote a book about Kevin Bin Laden. And so now they're getting criticism because he's taking credit on his own and they're talking about how important that the the, 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 the Navy SEAL is a team thing. And I'm just thinking that so relates to, to team sports in which everybody's a team. You can't, and you just can't, individuals can't just go out and take all that credit. And it's happening right now, something like the Navy Seals, which I think is amazing that somebody is doing some of the stuff they're doing. And, and I, but I do think it relates to sport and to the, the whole life. You talk about relationships, that is a relationship. And I think one of the guys that was criticizing the guys that are doing this, we're talking about relationships. That's, that's what's so important in Navy SEALs. And some of them will not come out. They will not take advantage of First guy in will come out. I heard it. They can take money in order oh. to, to. Those, those people are, are sworn to secrecy. And yeah. You, and you, so broke I, the, just, you broke the rules. In a way, it's kind of related, I think, to being a, being yeah. a relationship type person in a team setting where everybody has to take, do their role and, and it relates. It's a relationship. And I think. Mm -hmm. That's what our football coach is working on very much is the relationship with love. He talks about family where the kids can have for a while. I, yeah, that's, that's nice. I think he seems to be good. I, I like what he's doing. Dan, thank you very much.